Hi everybody, welcome. Today uh, we have another live stream and we are with Mr. Morelli. So I'm going to read you a little bit of his bio. So, uh, Frank Morelli, bassoon soloist, chamber musician, and teacher, studied with Stephen Maxim at the Manhattan and Juilliard schools of music, and was the first bassoonist awarded a doctorate by the Juilliard School. A member of the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra and the Woodwind Quintet, Windscape, he has also made nine appearances as a soloist in Carnegie Hall. He serves on the faculties of the Juilliard School, Yale School of Music, Manhattan School of Music, um, sorry, SUNY Stony Brook, and was recently named Distinguished Lecturer in Woodwinds at the Aaron Copeland School of Music, Queens College, um, and he performs exclusively on the late singer bassoon. Okay, so we're going to get started with uh, the masterclass with Sam Roten. So Sam today is going to be playing the Ob uh, Osborne Rhapsody. So I'm going to play you guys his recording right now. Uh, before before you do that, yeah, if you don't mind. Oh yes, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. First mm -hmm. of all, yes. Thank you very much. I think. Thank you for being here. Uh, sure, Teddy deserves a round of applause for having the initiative to get this started. And I know his colleagues of mine. I think a friend of mine, Ben Caymans, was up recently, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And Last it's, week. I think, great uh, to ask us. And I think you mentioned you were surprised that we actually said yes, right? Yeah, well, so know, many people said yes. It was so generous. Well, I'm glad. I, I'm not surprised because I know how great my colleagues are around the country. And the fact is, you know, we, we love teaching. We love that connection to students. You know, performance is all obviously very important to all of us. But I can say for myself, and I know it's true for others, that we it's kind of an equal, even if slightly different satisfaction out of teaching. And now during this, you know, particularly unusual time, which uh, even someone of my vintage has never witnessed before, let alone you young people, uh, the feeling of wanting to connect, to remain active, to be of help as teachers, it remains strong in us, you know, and so, Thank you for being different, like I said, taking that initiative. Uh, so anyway, I'm happy to be here. So let me just ask Sam a few things, and then we'll get, and then I'd ask you to play his recording. Sam, first of all, did you, did the recording start at the, like the bottom of the first page? Yes. You, yeah, okay. I just wanted to make sure I got the whole thing. I had a feeling, <laughs> it, that's fine, that's fine. That nothing wrong with that, just I wanted to ask that question to make sure I didn't miss something. Okay. Although we're going to hear it again anyway, but, you know. And let me ask you this before we start. Uh, what aspects of the piece, you know, when you practice, mm -hmm. you know, you're sitting down to practice. When you're preparing, or let's say when you're in your lesson, mm -hmm. uh, say, and this is sort of a lesson, right, a master class situation. And in your own practice, the question is, what am I trying to accomplish today? What is it that I'm working on, right? Yeah. And one of the important things a teacher has to do at the other end of, let's say, the week, if it were, or before the, that week in between, you might say, is to establish with the student the techniques that we're working on, the proper way to do them, and then what is, what you can, how you can practice it, whether it's etudes, exercise, well, that means, etudes means exercise anyway, but you know what I mean, different types of music or exercises, patterns, or methods that we would use to solve a certain problem, right? And then the teacher has to send you on your way with concepts hopefully firmly in place and a plan of action. Mm -hmm. My teacher used to say, let's say there, there's more than 12 not many more, but say more than 12 hour lessons in a semester when you're in school, right? Mm -hmm. So let's make believe it was only 12. So that would conveniently equal 24 hours in a year. That's why it's mm -hmm. good. So as my teacher would say, all right, that's 12, that's 24 hours. What are you going to do the other 364 days? Right? Mm -hmm. What is that you're working on? What is your plan? Now, obviously the teacher has an obligation to help you with that. But you also, and you're, you're a young professional, you're not a little kid, uh, it is your job to be self-critical. I mean that in the best sense of being thoughtful about your playing, not critical in a negative sense, mm -hmm. and establishing things that you think you could do better, 
mm -hmm. for that matter, assessing and establishing those things that through either other people's reaction to you and in your own mind that you have accomplished because we build on those things. So that's not being autistical or something to say, I can do this. I am happy with my sound or my intonation has really improved because it has happened because you worked at it. So it's honestly attained. It's not you won the lottery, you know, <laughs> you worked it up, you worked on it, right? So we build on those things. So it is not in any way uh, big headed or something to be proud of things you have accomplished, but mindful of what needs to be improved. Mm -hmm. To seek advice like a good teacher as to what those things are, what could be improved, right? So if blah, 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 let me ask you, uh, what is it that, because I heard it sounds quite good, by the way, you sound, I listened to it and it sounds beautiful sound, quite beautiful playing. Obviously, there's always something we can work on. Luckily, otherwise, I'd have to just make stuff up for the next half hour, which I could do, believe me. <laughs> but, um, what, what in particular would you say would be great for us to focus on? And then we'll listen and we'll go from there. So. Um, one thing I really was focusing on with this uh, piece was working on pacing and my use of vibrato to not be too much that it's, overtaking of what I'm trying to do, but added in just enough that it's a color that intensifies and amplifies what I'm trying to do. Excellent. So mostly pacing is what I was, what I'm really working on with this piece. Okay, so pacing and, and sort of the use of vibrato color. Yes. All of, all of say your palette, your entire mm -hmm. matrix of, of uh, colors and such that you could use in painting this picture. Yes. Great. Those are excellent things to work on. And so with that in mind, and so this way also our listeners have a, a framework now in which to listen. That doesn't mean we have to only listen for those things, but we know you're sensitive to those things right now. So we could all be thinking, all right, if I were, if I were looking at my performance of this along those lines, what would I be thinking? What would I be noticing? How, what, how might I achieve those, those goals, right? So I think that'll, that'll do it. I think that's enough of an introduction, but I think that helps frame our thinking. And then of course, if you have more questions, Sam, when we get okay. back, and of course, if I hear something else, you know, I'm gonna, you know, we're not limited to those topics. Yeah. Good. All right, thank you. So, Teddy, we're ready to roll when you are. Great. I will start the recording. Very good.
Great, we will get started with the masterclass portion. So I'll just let you guys go ahead. And yeah, we can hear you now. I was listening on the, mm -hmm. on, the on Facebook mm -hmm. again. On my phone. Okay. Looks back. Okay, great. And you guys are on, so you can. Okay, go thank ahead. you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Sam, I had heard it once, and now I listened sort of over Facebook while uh, <laughs> while while it was going, most of it anyway. So, uh, nice job, very nice job. Thank you. So get right down the questions you talked about, which were this uh, question of. Use the vibrato and color and of um, shaping, pacing. Yeah. Now, pacing, you know, uh, the shape and the pace of a piece, you know, there's sort of one might say you can go from the outside in, or you could go from the inside out. But to really understand a piece, you really have to start from outside and see the larger picture and then work your way into uh, smaller. Um, when I'm really trying to learn a piece, you know, something. I'm always, if I'm playing a piece, I'm really trying to learn a piece, but let's say I'm thinking of important recital or a recording where I really want to be um, focused, you know, to be focused on, on it. Um, that, uh, like, all right, so in this piece in particular, you started at the bottom of the first page, which is fine. In general, uh, what would you say the form of the entire uh, Osborne, all five minutes of it, or whatever it is, you know, four minutes and 30 seconds is what I have in pencil in my part, probably from the last time I did it mm -hmm. some years ago. But anyway, how would you, what is the form of the piece? It's ABA form, and there's like two sections in the B section. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, see, that's something you want to know. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, one of the um, and clearly, the B section is different than the A sections mm -hmm. in terms of, although there are moving florid patterns also in the A sections, both A sections, the outer sections, the B section has also a, a sort of one heated moment in particular. In fact, he often uses the word in and you know, which means to get, yep. but um, what you want to achieve, so the first thing I want to achieve when I'm thinking of pacing is to establish that form. Mm -hmm. and, to, and the important thing, and you did this, even though we didn't hear it the first time, but we, you know, I can assume, I can project because you also play the A section on its return, uh, that we would have heard, if you had you started at the very beginning, that rather contemplative opening section, mostly open, uh, contemplative, obviously it heats up as it goes along, mm -hmm. but other with that kind of brooding to be or not to be kind of, uh, right, almost yeah. like you know, pathetic symphony or something, something thoughtful and I'm not sure what I think of this. And, and then the middle section is more florid in a way, mm -hmm. right? A piece that really needs this kind of approach is the, uh, the, is the uh, Elgar romance. Mm -hmm. The piece is five minutes long. I always say it has like 20 minutes of decisions in a five minute piece. <laughs> and plus the middle section, if you're not careful, could just sound like you're kind of meandering on and you really did not enter a new phase, a new chapter of the piece when you mm -hmm. got that section. So we're not mm -hmm. making this into a master class about the Elgar romance. But the fact is we have to keep those things in mind. If you're doing Schumann romances or fantasy pieces or many pieces written originally for the bassoon, mm -hmm. um, it would be the same, the same consideration. Um, so that, that's as far as that pacing goes. Uh, one thing I noticed, a smaller point was, and, and I know this, from my own uh, time, you know, working on this piece originally, uh, 
when you're getting ready to return to the first section. Mm -hmm. Around 144 there. That da da dee. I would say it's up to you, but then es itacion, which I think means with hesitation. Yeah. I recall. Now, so what I would be careful for is to pace out the eighth notes more. Okay. The third group of eighth notes, the ones that actually returned, the last three, in other words, before 43, mm -hmm. played those definitely slower. Okay. It's not slower, you know, just like uh, clocking at speed. You were winding back down, easing back down into this more brooding place in your own mind. Yeah. Or extrovert or more out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so because he does that in three sequences, right, mm -hmm. uh, I would be a little more careful to, like, I would make each one, the second definitely slower than the first and then the third slower than the second, you know. Yeah. And that didn't quite come off that way. That's a very small point, but that's a way to be careful. There are times when we're pacing something like that and we might be doing certain longer notes and feeling the slower tempo. Then all of a sudden there are four sixteenths or two eighths or four eighths. And we kind of go back where it would go back, revert to mm -hmm. a more en a a a energetic, a more active is a better word, more active interpretation. And that sort of jars it a little bit. Now yeah. we're talking, I'm talking on the small scale, but you, you brought up the topic and so I'm, looking for ways to help you with that, not because I went, oh my goodness, what is this young man doing? <laughs> That's just an example, right? Yeah. Of that. Uh, Vibrato-wise, I thought you did, you did, a, you, your vibrato sounds quite good to me. Do you have a way that you work on your vibrato? Yes, I, every day I set a metronome to 60, I do quarter notes, and then eighth notes, then triplets, then sixteenths and five lits. And then I integrate, we're going between different subdivisions in a, just my scale of the day that I'm working on. Excellent. That's exactly what you should do. 60 is great because, and going to five is great. Mm -hmm. because I find, and, and obviously others do, because this is a popular way of doing it. Uh, you know, it's a common way in a good sense, common, you know, consensus mm -hmm. sort of way. Um, Five at 60 makes a 300. Mm -hmm. It's about as fast as we have to go in terms of a metronome marking with vibrato. You might occasionally, one might occasionally get above it in a moment of real, you know, passion. And sometimes it's slower, and especially in registers, like a low note. You, it's kind of hard on a low B flat to get it up to five per beat <laughs> at, at 60. So there are natural and totally reasonable, appropriate Variate, there is variation within that. But mm -hmm. the thing about five at 60 as opposed to say four at 75, which would be the same mm -hmm. aggregate, is four at 75 would be more regular. And the yeah. five at 60 allows for this odd kind of floating a little bit off of the beat. Yeah. You don't sound too mechanical. So that's, I think, from, from my thinking and probably from everybody's or how it got there, why 60 and then working one's way up to the five tuplet, like you said, is the way to go. And also to remember at the slower speeds, you do it more with a more jagged, right? Uh, yeah. Exaggerated, uh, 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 you know, something you wouldn't play. Yeah. Unless it was really called for, for some odd reason in a <laughs> modern piece or something, right? But mm -hmm. to both develop the muscles and kind of develop the pathway so that we become aware of how we're doing it. But obviously, as you speed up, and obviously I'm saying this also for the benefit of the audience, as you speed up, in fact, you do want to thin it down and make it less uh, uh, hard-edged. And that, I'm not saying that, again, I'm not saying that out of criticism, but just that's the method methodology. The other thing to remember, and in fact, I have a picture here. Let me grab it. Um, uh, that I've used before and they're getting all faded because I probably did it 20 years ago or something like that. But, you know, I, I think of sound. If you think of uh, 
picture of a note, so to speak, if you could make a, an x-ray of it. Mm -hmm. If you think of resonance, right, of a sound, I think of, say, the outer circle is the basic pitch of the note, mm -hmm. the sound of a bassoon. And in fact, Sam's sound, like your natural color of sound. You and I pick up the same read, the same instrument, we're going to sound a little different. Mm -hmm. and that's, it's like our vocal cords are different. You hear, you know, Domingo and you hear Pavarotti, you hear two different sounds, two great singers. But in the middle of both of their sounds, and hopefully your sound and my sound, if we're doing a good job, is the core of the sound. Mm -hmm. The ring in the sound, how one voices the sound as a singer. Voice yeah. sound. Now, that, those two circles, as I just showed you, that's of a slice in time, right? Because in, in, in essence, we're looking into the sound, so it's almost like we'd be looking forward as the sound kept going. So mm -hmm. if you retract that circle, it becomes a tube, right? Mm -hmm. Now this is sort of the picture I already showed you, let's say, but now we're looking through that because time travels. And the sound is just, so this is, instead of that was a millisecond note, <laughs> this is now a whole note, <laughs> you know, so to speak, right? Because we're holding it out. And if you can see there, you'll see there's that tube, the bore of the sound, the core of the sound, like, a, like the bore of a flute. And you see the sine wave going through it, right? That yeah. way. That is the concept that that's where your vibrato goes. Okay. And so the way to find your vibrato, and again, I think you're doing this quite well, is you first have to have a good resonant sound with that core, which you were getting a nice core in the sound on the recording, and then you put the vibrato through it. You wouldn't want, when I give you yet another, you're benefiting from my beautiful artwork. There, uh, I can send you signed lithograph versions of this for only 1995. <laughs> Just joking. Now, <laughs> here's, if you vibrate, now of course this is putting two different dimensions like at, 40, at 90 degrees to one another, so it's not really that representational, but I think you get the point. You, I showed you in the picture is basically this guy in the middle, right? Yeah. That's going through the sound, even though it's going in the, you know, but you understand what I mean. Yep. I'm trying to avoid at my age is the old man vibrato. I don't want to have my vibrato be basically below the sound and below the core of the pitch, the center of the note and only kind of getting up to it. And I hear that a lot, not just in old men like me, but in a lot of bassoon players. Then, on the other hand, you wouldn't want to get a tight vibrato where it's up here, you know, above the sound and your sound is tight and uh, the vibrato would be, or sometimes called like a nanny goat vibrato. You know, mm -hmm. here's some old time recordings and you hear that kind of, uh, almost a fast vibrato. That doesn't mean that person didn't sound beautiful in person, but on the recording, it does sound a little, a little odd, a little antiquated. Yeah. So, so when you're working on finding that vibrato, remember you start with a good sound, mm -hmm. you start with the resonance, and then you put the vibrato through it. Right? Yep. Uh, so that's how to work on that. Okay. Then the other thing is to remember in terms of color, in terms of in interpretation, crescendo de crescendo, that the two macro the two macro categories of expression, mm -hmm. I almost hate to call them expression, interpretation. I don't know if they're really expression, are dynamics and tempo. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like taste is usually one doesn't want to um, use too much rubato. I'm not talking about in this, this is different. Like mm -hmm. playing a stuff, one has to be able to play more. Uh, control tempo wise, right? Yeah. So one shouldn't just use, oh, I'm going to be musical now and start moving around the tempo, right? Yeah. The other one that's more um, macro is just getting louder and getting slow. But those are macro because really the expression, and you're talking about that because you were talking color use of vibrato, is what you're doing inside the sound and how you're voicing that sound from note to note. Mm -hmm. That's that's in, I call it like interior expression, inside. That's where the real music making is going on. It's from okay. moving from note to note, singing from note. And again, you're doing that a lot. Moving from note to note, 
singing to the next note, hearing where you're headed, knowing that there are certain notes, say, at the top of a crescendo, and indeed you may be making a crescendo. It's not like saying, don't make a crescendo. It says crescendo. But the difference may be, the thing that is more effective may not be just that you started at certain decibel level and got up to a bigger decibel level, but the intensity of the sound, the intensity of that core at the top was at the height of your intensity, where not your, the limits of your possibility, but very much heightened as opposed to relaxed, right? That is real. That's like inflection in my voice. The way I'm talking to you now, when I'm, especially I'm trying not to talk too loud and screaming and all that is when I'm being emphatic about something, you just hear there's a little more, a little more core in my sound, right? I'm saying, look, I really mean that. I don't have to yell that at you. I really mean that. Yell at I'm not going to do it, you know. <laughs> But you know what I mean. I don't have to yell at you. I just say, you know, I really mean that. I think we're, man, you sounded great. I really mean that. It's not, I'm not just saying that, you know. You could tell when, oh, hey, man, you sounded great, you know. <laughs> quite the same level of uh, sincerity. Yeah. Plus, it didn't have the same phrase. It didn't have the same inflection. Mm -hmm. So think in terms of inflection. Think in terms of, of creating a great resonant sound and putting your vibrato through it. Think in terms of shape and, and, and um, uh, form, mm -hmm. form like in this case ABA form. You're absolutely right. Think uh, and then thinking like to me this piece it starts this sort of brooding thing, and I often feel when you get to the second section where you came in, you know where you started the day, I always think it almost sounds like a chant. Yeah. I almost feel like at the beginning I'm troubled. I'm moody. And then all of a sudden, maybe I'm walking along or I notice there's a church over there and I go, or it could be a temple, it could just be a glade of peace, you know, it could just be a beautiful spot. And I sit and I think, mm -hmm. almost as if the you can hear like you've gone to some abbey and you hear the uh, you know, vespers being sung or something, and it brings you into a contemplative mood or something like that. So it's good to have those images. You could have your own, and you played it very musically, so I'm not saying that because I thought you played in a cold way. But I certainly think that way myself. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it's Playing over Zoom is not the most rewarding thing to do, but is there something in this you'd like to play for me in particular? Could you work on that... Um, middle section a little bit, just for five minutes or so? Up to sure. You. Yeah, make sure to read is, yeah, got some. <laughs> my, as I say during these classes, my hot air dried out your read. <laughs> you have to make sure it's still gonna play. So play a few notes, make sure it's honking. <laughs> you get further away from the mic. Yeah. Because, you know that picks it way up. You know, yeah. That's one of the. That's a whole a whole nother topic. How to record a bassoon? Yeah. <laughs> it's very tricky to do. It's very tricky to do because the sound comes out of too many different. Depending on the register and the notes, really, it comes out of different parts of the bassoon. Okay. So not one part in particular, but it comes out at different levels at different parts of the bassoon. Yeah. So let's try it from the bottom and up. You know, our second section, we as we know, is the B section. Okay. Okay, that sounds, it's quite loud. That's not your fault. Do you have on, turn on original sound? Do you have original sound on? I do. Okay. So some of it's just, that's, the, like I said, the problem with Zoom is it's not the greatest spot for uh, opportunity to, to work in a master class setting. And that's all right. We, we have to listen past it. I've been doing it since March as a teacher. And we know, we, you know, we look past those things. But what I would say is, first of all, you know, he writes mezzo piano cantabile, 
So I'd say you could float the sound a little more, like support it well, but put less air through the instrument. Okay. Try that. And, but with not the idea of, of uptight, but like I said, almost this like it were that that Vesper kind of you know, you're hearing something in a in a cathedral or something. If you were imitating hearing a far off prayer chant going on, what would that sound like to you? Okay. you no. Know, Conjure that up. Okay. Right, right. And I would suggest this, even in terms of the phrase. Hold on a minute. All right. It, I'm often students of mine, and when I do classes, are hearing me talk about the rule of threes. Not that I came up with it, but I notice it in music like all the time. Yeah. And what it, what it means is, generally speaking, you have something that's repeat. You have like two A's and then a B. Mm -hmm. Talking about the form again. In this case, like you talk about pacing, um, he makes a statement. Da, da, di, da, di, da, da, di, da. Right? Then he doesn't repeat it verbatim, but the notes are basically the same. Da, 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 di, da, da, di, da. Right? So it's, sort of, it's an answer. It's related to the first statement. Then the B section is usually twice as long, at least, as the A section. Mm -hmm. and Right? That is the answer to the first two. Yeah. That's what I would suggest. Like, really hear A, A prime, B. Does it make sense to you? you yeah. Got, okay, I just want to make sure I'm making... I make, sometimes that makes sense. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, that, that's the kind of thing where it would help you to organize the piece. You know, the piece, although it's modern, you know, it's quite tonal. It's pretty tame. It's a nice piece, I, I'm not saying. So it's not as hard to organize for your own mind as well as for the listener. I mean, one has to put a lot of thought into Bach cello suites, you know, especially the preludes yeah. to, uh, of those suites in order to... Uh, put them forth in an organized fashion, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how I would do I would chart out these motives more than you are now. Okay. And that really, so, you know, as when I was a student, you know, I'd sit through theory and analysis and all that, and I was somewhat interested in it, but I can't say that I was always so smart to know its practical application. But as interpreters, as performers, there's actually very serious practical application. And it's not just stuff we learn. I'm not putting this on you, you know, in terms of your attitude. I'm giving you my own lousy attitude <laughs> from the past. That these, that these um, subjects, this is where they, they come to benefit us. Mm -hmm. So I would say, if you haven't, really sit down and analyze the piece. I mean, they don't have to go crazy over it. I mean, but really see what things relate one to the other. And many things you already know. I could hear it in the way you play it, and you, it's just obvious, the return. You know, there are many relationships, just like the, as there are in Bach. You know, when we hear how he takes motives and it returns and sections, and some things are more stretto and other areas are more placid, right? Bach does that within his music, and so does Osborne, right? There are heated sections, literally. He calls it that. There are they are contemplative or more uh, uh, tranquil sections. So that's that's my advice. And we don't have a lot of time. And this class can't go on that long. In fact, I have to go to a meeting at eight, a Zoom meeting at eight o'clock. So I'd like to take some questions. But first, any questions from you? You sound beautiful, though, and it was especially nice to hear it, the the copy that that Teddy had sent me. So I listened to it, you know, in a in a better setting. Um, and and you sound you sound really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't think I have any questions right now. I'll think of I'll I'll think of some probably during the Q and A, and then I'll I'll yeah. <laughs> yell okay. out. now or just get in touch with me. Okay, sounds good. Get in touch with me.
Okay. I, no, no, don't don't hesitate. Okay. I can be of help. In my here, I, in my um, as I say, my house arrest during the plague. I could probably probably find some time to get in touch with you. Okay. Right. Although I'm probably busy with practice and other things, projects, but needless to say, I'm not running around. I'm not at summer festivals. As you probably were, you to go to one originally. I was supposed to. Yes. <laughs> Where were you supposed to go? Texas Music Festival. Yeah. All right. Well, next year yeah. we have, you know. But you sound great, and just like you're doing with this, just keep yourself motivated. Don't give up. Thank you. I'm not. I'm practicing every day. But this old guy could practice every day, so can you. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So, Teddy, are there any questions? Yes. We're going to get to those. So, um, first question. Let me find it. Uh, what are some concepts you took away from Mr. Maxim, and what are your read concepts, as in shapes, scrapes, etc.? Well, that should only take about a week, but I'll give you a quick answer. Mr. Maxim's, some of what I took away from Mr. Maxim are just the very things we were just talking about. He was, he was very much into, we didn't talk about support, but voicing the notes like we were talking about, which goes also backwards into the areas, not backwards, but, you know, back in terms of the succession of playing, into breathing and support. Those were very important to Mr. Maxim. He played at the Metropolitan Opera, and he modeled his play in his teaching after the great singers that he was accompanying and enjoying. And he would watch them very carefully in the Zitz probe in the rehearsals where they aren't just standing above you on the stage. He would talk to the singers. You know, he picked their brains, you might say, uh, and that had a lot to do with his teaching um, style. And then this question of color and inside the sound and moving around, that was very much his kind of thing. So I'd say I, those seeds were certainly planted in my mind and my playing and in my own pedagogy by Mr. Maxim. Uh, as far as reed style, I play a reed that's probably middle-sized reed. Um, uh, and uh, in there it's not too wide, not too narrow. It's not unlike some of the standard middle line shapes that you see. Um, but I play on a longer reed. I usually, my blade is from the, the, first of all, there's no collar, no collar cut in to the reed. The, the first wire goes where the bark, you know, is where the two begins, so to speak, on the bark behind the back of the scraped part of the blade. Uh, and then there are three wires or four wires sometimes because I don't wrap reeds. See, I don't bother with the wrapping. So I have two extra, I have two extra wire at the bottom. And that I learned from Mr. Maxim. He said, why are you wasting your time wrapping reeds? So that was the end of that. And uh, 45 years ago, or something like that. 50 years ago. Oh, my <laughs> God. Actually, 50 years ago. And um, so was all of a sudden, another four or five years got added on. Uh, in terms of scrape, I like using, I use a Rieger tip finisher with the standard Rieger tip. I don't like having the Morelli tip or some other tip. I, my reeds are pretty f heavy in the back, around 40 thousandths of an inch. I don't know the millimeters, but you can do the math. I also, uh, I, I like, I have an old Pfeiffer profiler with the flats and the pins, so it makes a very pronounced spine. I don't prefer, although they make great equipment, like I use the Rieger tip finisher, I don't prefer the way the uh, Rieger uh, uh, profiler cuts because the spine isn't as pronounced. And I, just the way I learned back on the Pfeiffer machine, and, and I'm not, while I'm not a spokesperson, I'll just tell you the MD profiler, which comes with the flats. And, and also, you can get a ramp that's either straight, so that the, when, the, when the profiler goes, it goes from back to front in a straight line, or you can have that ramp where, I'm going to do it the other way because my fingers work this way, if this were the back. So I just turned the machine around. If, if you went from front to back instead of a straight line, it has an extra ramp at the front where it starts down and then goes at a more drastic angle towards the front. I don't prefer that kind because I want more wood towards the front and then I superimpose the tip finisher on it. Both can work, but I'm telling you what, I, being asked a question, that's the answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, great, thank you. Um, okay, next question. Who are your favorite non-bassoon playing musicians to listen to? Fritz Wunderlich is number one. W-U-N-D-E-R L-I-C-H, Fritz Wunderlich. He was a very famous Mozart tenor that died way too young. 
And with my students, we study his singing and we copy it. We play, mm -hmm. we listen, and then we copy. Uh, so he is by far one of uh, my almost ideal. Um, I tend to like the tenor more than the than the other voices uh, as to emulate, because just like I showed you that picture of the core of the sound, the two circles, essentially that middle circle is definitely is essentially the tenor range. You know, the difference between a tenor and a really good baritone is not that the baritone doesn't have the tenor voice in his sound, although he doesn't go that high, as high, but that he actually has, and that's why the bassoon is the greatest instrument that ever was, is that we have that tenor, we have that tenor core, but we also, when we're in the lower registers, open it up with yet a whole nother dimension of sound below. And so we're fortunate that we have a larger playing field because there are more partials available to us uh, above the fundamental of any note that we're playing to create the sound. So I listen, like when we were talking, I was even saying, using the term with Sam, of, of, um, of voicing the sound, going from note to note. That's a very vocal approach. And, and to me, the, go, the, 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 the king of that is, is, is Wunderlich. Wunderlich. The, his counterparts at the time were the baritones were Hermann Prey like Prey, P-R-E-Y, and, uh, and um, Dietrich Fischer Dieskau, D-I-E-S-K-A-U. Fischer Dieskau, Wunderlich, Hermann Prey, they were all working around the same time. And uh, of course, in the case of Dieskau and Prey, they lived much longer, and so they had more career later than Mr. Wunderlich, who passed away young. Um, and then, like, I love... Pavarotti, who I got to play with many times, and I still have that sound in my head. But then also people that I love, it's like Stan Getz. I grew up as a sax player listening to Stan Getz and Ella Fitzgerald, and sounds like that. So, so my taste, the things that I value uh, come from a variety of, of sources, but I'd say singers more than instrumentalists. Okay. Yeah, okay, um, okay next question. What brand of cane is your favorite? Uh, that's hard to say. I mean, mostly I taste test cane with my students because I have a stock of cane that I bought. I'm using cane that's, uh, well, to say it's older than you guys is not saying much, Teddy, because you're still <laughs> in high school, right? Yeah. You're grown up then, but uh, yeah. I have cane that I'm using that's like 30 years old, you know, 35 years old. Uh, uh, of the recent vintages, I certainly like, uh, I've used Glotan cane myself and with students. I think the Rieger cane is really good. Uh, is is very consistent. I found in the past, anyway, Danzig cane, which is quite excellent. I had a little trouble making reeds out of it because it seemed a little dense for me, a little little um, hard. But it's very good. Uh, Rigotti makes good cane. Barton, who is uh, our sponsor here tonight, they use different brands of cane that they they're using Danzig and. I forget some of the other ones, but they, you know, uh, and that they sell, and uh, that's also very good stuff. In fact, Martin and I right now are trying to come up with a, a profile and shape that we could call it the Morelli. Ooh. Yeah, shape and profile. Mm -hmm. And you won't have to come to the Godfather to get it, so it'll be much safer for you than having to get it. <laughs> so, um, so I'm hoping, I'm sure we're going to come to some conclusion on that we just got started although they sent me some stuff that looks really great so i haven't had it i just got it so i haven't had a chance to make blanks out of it yet but especially in this day of the coronavirus i feel like my students are going to need more um for the next period of time more sources because we won't be able to work on it probably for a while you know realistically mm -hmm. together in person I can make reads and send it to them or, you know, fix up old reads and send it. I've done that already for some of my younger students. I mean, freshmen, type, you know, college. I don't have high school students. But um, anyway, that's the, that's, that's, the, that's the cane situation. But I have my own wine cellar, cane cellar, so to speak, mm -hmm. of boxes of cane I bought a long time ago. Trench stuff. Mm -hmm. Up next. Okay. Yeah, um... Okay, so this next question, uh, kind of um, being a non-heckle player, 
uh, it seems like almost everyone in the top orchestras are playing heckles. Does playing other models put us at a disadvantage because of that? I, Bell, Fox, Puchner, whatever. I don't think so. I, I think um, times have changed. Uh, the, uh, you know, first of all, a lot of people, some people are playing bell bassoons mm -hmm. in orchestras. I mean, sometimes they've gone to them after they got the job, but they're playing bell bassoons. The whole San Francisco section, I think, plays bell bassoons. Of course, guys in Canada are playing bell bassoons. Um, Chris Millard plays a bell. My former student who plays in the Toronto Symphony uh, won the job on a bell bassoon. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't know if it's Stefan's playing on one now, Levesque, he was my student. So he had heckles. I don't know where he is right now with that. I think, uh, and, you know, with, with heckles going way out of sight now financially, and with time going by, uh, the other major makers have really stepped up. And they see, I think, the opportunity for them to really make, a, make headway in the market because they're just, it's just a ridiculous amount of money to buy a heckle. And, uh, I, I went to this bassoon because I just love it. Lightsinger bassoon has a ring, it has a projection, it has a flexibility that even is superior to my two heckles. I have a 10 and a 12 sitting in the closet. Hmm. And um, at the last three and a half, well, not three, three and a something years anyway, three years and several months, have been performing, recording only on the Lightsinger bassoon. So I felt like if I was going to represent him, and that was my choice, not his, that uh, I would only play that instrument. Some people that represent a company don't always play the instrument. Mm -hmm. I don't mention any names, but that's a good question to ask somebody. <laughs> but that's why I put that in there, because I want people to know it's the instrument I'm playing on exclusively, because I believe in it. That doesn't mean if you play another instrument, you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So the short answer is you need a good, I mean, you need a good instrument to go to, a, to, go to an audition. And unfortunately, sometimes it's a conductor that is prejudiced. I had a student of mine who won a job and was a finalist, and then the, he had like a Renard bassoon, and I had been telling him, man, you got to invest your money, you got to get a bassoon, and the conductor said, I can't hire you on a student bassoon, and Renard is a great instrument. When people ask me, a young person, what should we do for our kid? Buy a Renard. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just like that. So, so, you know, I don't say that because I don't like the instrument. But now you're showing up in the pit or a pit or in the on stage with people that have Powell flutes and and you know buffet clarinets and you know uh, you have your Renard bassoon. you know it, it's like yeah so that you have to be careful for that but I hear too many people play great on every instrument and so that's my answer mm -hmm. one more question then I'm gonna have to bail yeah outside. one more great um so it might be a slightly longer one, but what is probably the biggest concept for you to impart on your students? Wow. Uh, well, making a good sound. Breathing, support, it all starts with making a good resonant tone. And then the other sort of guru, philosopher, Yoda side mm -hmm. is to tap into the joy of it. Do what you do because you love it. Remember that. When I'm working with the student, and even when we're working on a problem, and I don't care how difficult the problem is, it's going to take the time it takes to be fixed. But it's always a joyful experience for me. Mm -hmm. It's always joyful. And we are so lucky to be musicians, to have music in our lives. We are the counterculture. <laughs> we are the counterculture. Now I'm doing like the, the, the network, that old movie, I'm mad as hell and I won't take it anymore. <laughs> it's we're the counterculture. By that I mean... We're not just totally into instant gratification. We know that things take a long time to accomplish, and we're willing to put that time in. And we also, we support one another, right? We are team players, we're leaders, but also we're followers, we're part of the team. We get together with a shared vision of wanting to make the most beautiful sounds we can possibly make, and then we surround ourselves. We get to be in this sound all the time. So what's better than that? Nothing is better than that. So even now in this time of, of COVID, I consider that life is beautiful. Life is great. And that I've been blessed to be a musician for my entire career. And that's what I tell my students, if anything, because that kind of motivation and happiness will, will really help you to, to succeed. It's a wonderful way of thinking. I really like that. Very inspirational. Um, sure. Yeah. And if there's a little bit of time, I'm going to talk about our wonderful sponsor, Barton Kane. So Barton Kane has been super generous helping me out with the stream. 
And as uh, Mr. Morelli mentioned earlier, they have a huge variety of cane, Donzi, Donati, Rigotti, whatever, anything you could ask for. A uh, ton of different shapes. I personally use the um, Hertzberg shape with Billy Short's profile. And, you know, as they mentioned, soon you might be able to buy the Morelli shape. Um, so, yeah, if you're in the market for amazing gouge shape profile cane, go check out Barton Cane. Amazing customer service, super nice people. And thank you so much for sponsoring us. Yeah, here, here. Uh, yeah, yeah. I must confer with my young colleague. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, if there's uh, any closing statements you or Sam would like to make, no, Please. thank you, uh -huh. Sam. That's what I'd like. Oh, we beat it. We oh, in your Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Sam. Yes. Um, so, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Morelli. Thank you, Sam, for playing. And yeah, that is going to be our stream for today. So, thank you all for coming. Stay tuned uh, for next week's artist. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.